see you all here today to talk about ways you can protect yourselves and feel safe on the job. With me, I have Colin McLean. Good morning, good afternoon now. From McLean Securities. Jimmy West. Jimmy West from McLean Securities. Er Jason McLean. Hey guys, how are you? Alan Brower. <laughs> Kevin Norman. <laughs> Paul Giles. Hey. Phyllis Shaffron. Hey. Paul D'Amato. Hey. And somewhere there's Luna, Luna DeBerto. One year ago, we weren't so sure we would get to this day. As many of you know, our union was opposed to the Flex Ops program originally as designed. We felt that our members were not protected. We were, we were especially concerned about the safety working on those shifts that were proposed. We took our concerns to court. The judge agreed. The program was halted. Our concerns had to be addressed first. Next, we sat down with the Housing Authority to suggest ways the Flex Ops could work better for you. We said, here's what's important. One, make it voluntary. Two, give a monetary incentive. But that's not all we told them at the time. Our biggest concern was your safety. That had to be ensured, NYCHA agreed. So we hired security experts to analyze safety problems and make recommendations on how to solve them. That's who you see here today. We said those safety issues had to be addressed by NYCHA before the program began. We also advocated for monitoring those safety measures on a regular basis to make sure we were achieving our goals. The other thing we said was that safety brochure had to be created. And that's what we have here. We wanted a brochure that clearly outlines the ways you can help yourselves be safe. That was done. But that's not all. We want to hear from you, these experts yourself, and get those safety tips in person. Feel free to ask them questions. That's why we're here today. We care about you. We want you to know that you take pride in your work, and we take pride in the work that you do. But that can only happen when you feel good about your workplace, and in fact, that's when you're even more productive. So for the union and for the housing authority and for our members, today is a win, win, win. I'm actually really happy to, to stand here alongside my brother Jason uh, and Jimmy West. Jimmy is uh, my partner in this, in this effort. He retired, he spent 10 years in housing and is a very well-regarded uh, expert in housing policing and Irving, who's with NYCHA, we created this whole thing together. We walked, Irving representing the security office at NYCHA, walked at five o'clock in the morning, checking on lighting, checking on doors, sometimes along with your members. Flex Ops is Flex Ops. I don't know the union business. I don't, I don't pretend to know the union business. We do know what's a safe environment to go into work and what's not. And so we kind of put the sneakers on and did the verticals and, and you know, really respect what you guys do to get these developments ready every day for the residents for when they wake up. Again, I'm not here to talk about whether or not Flex Ops works for everybody. I'm here to tell you different ways that we believe you could continue to stay safe. There's some important numbers on the back of this that I'd like you to think about. We're gonna get you the phone numbers for the Community Affairs Department, your crime prevention, very importantly, your domestic violence officers and your youth officers to their direct phone numbers. The New York City Police Department, again, having never been a cop, I'm not here to represent them, have just implemented a great program called the Neighborhood Coordination Officers. They're rolling that out in some pretty, you know, difficult, tough neighborhoods. 
taking guys off their radio runs for three hours a day and having them interact with their community. I know for a fact that they're trying to do that in the developments as well. So we're hoping that you get more and more communication with the police department, which will help you subtly, confidentially, and in the right way, solve some problems that you may face on a daily basis. So we did everything today in coordination with NYCHA's security office. My name is Irving Andrada. Uh, I'm with the New York City Housing Authority. I'm, I'm one of the security managers with the, in the Office of Safety and Security. We want to work together. We're working together with the union in order to, uh, uh, to, to demonstrate that we are interested in safety and security at your locations. Okay, we got you these, uh, this information to reinforce that we are trying to better, uh, uh, give you better security, give you better safety at the locations, at your, at your developments. We're not here to speak to you, we're here to hear from you also, and that's important. You, this is the, the best time you have to talk to us, and uh, the only thing I ask that if you do have comments or questions uh, that you allow everyone else to speak one person at a time and then we'll go from there we'll answer whatever questions it is that you have it's a condensed version a common sense version a discussion point of the big training program that you went through it's not active shooter training so first thing that we should talk about situational awareness right there's no doubt that every one of you is very conscious of where you are and what you're doing every time but you have to get the big picture of what you're looking every day your environment may change I just don't want you to get comfortable. And my third day of doing these verticals in a row, I got comfortable and started not to pay attention as much as I was on the first day. So I can only imagine after 18 years, 19 years, or 20 years of service to your union or with your union, you would get complacent at times. So situational awareness is actually the biggest key to all of your safety. Why does he always have his button jacket? Why is he always touching his hip? You know. Is he carrying a gun? Is he not carrying a gun? Does he have a weapon? Is he a cop? Is he not a cop? Does he want to talk to me? Things that just you're walking through the streets, things that I know you do on a daily basis, but you should be always aware of that. When you come to the office, don't just think about, um, you know, getting to your job and cleaning up and starting to clean up. One of the things that I started to do um, when we take the elevator up to the top, because I'm sweating right now, so imagine I had to walk up all the steps, forget about it. But I get up to the top and we go to check the roof landings. And a lot of times, not a lot, but a fair amount of times, there was um, not a resident sleeping in, the, uh, sleeping in the stairwells. In that situation, we're yelling, housing, coming on up, security, doing a check, making some noise, banging stuff. You may have a... Um, uh, a, a dustpan or something like that. You should bang it. Not to the point where some neighbor's gonna open up the door and slap you, but you should bang, you should make some noise going up so that you don't startle somebody and create a situation where someone just wakes up and is scared. Understood, that's a common practice, but noise is a great deterrent and it takes away some of that edge of somebody when they know you're coming, all right? If you encounter somebody like that, we all know what to do. Boom, remove yourself from the situation. We're gonna to get to that and notify your supervisors. Um, the most important thing, like I was describing myself, is watch people's hands. Just if you end up in a situation where you're speaking to a neighbor or you're speaking to a tenant or you're speaking to somebody, just watch where their hands are at all times. It's pretty common sense. Um, avoid any confrontational situations. You're not security, you're not trained in it, you're not law enforcement, you have no responsibility to act like a law enforcement officer. Remove yourself from that situation. Most importantly, know where you are all the time. How do you get out? First thing I do, where are the stairs? Where are the doors? How do I get out of the situation? Where do I put myself in a safe environment? You definitely should not, under any circumstances, enter a room, whether it's a an elevator room on the roof or a boiler room or a slop sink with somebody in there or if it's unlocked. It's very important for you to maintain lock consistency. I would say in every building I found 
five to ten slop sinks unlocked, a lot of that falls on us. Broken locks, that either, if it's fresh, we need to report it to our supervisors and repair that. To your point, more specifically, you are 110% right. We need to get the police department to help evict, for lack of a better word, I know that's probably not a formal word. You shouldn't have people sleeping on your landings, and you, spe you especially shouldn't have people sleeping in your workspaces. We, we actually have meetings with the captains or the commanders to ensure that uh, when, when we call these uh, uh, individuals that are unauthorized into our, uh, in our buildings, that, we, that they do respond to it, uh, that they do remove them and uh, uh, identify them so that if they, if they continue to do that, then there, there, there would be uh, some sort of uh, crime that they can charge them with, especially if they're damaging and breaking our locks and things of that nature. So one thing that's not mentioned, it's a really good question. When you have those situations, and we encounter them all the time with folks up on rooftops. I started as a caretaker in 1990. That was the height of the, the end of like the heroin era and the height of the crack era. And there were people everywhere, basements, uh, even on your ramps. You didn't even have to get in, right? Rooftops, motor rooms, slop sinks. Um, one of the things that happened several years ago, and this is just a note for you all, when, when the reporting occurs, when the caretakers come back to the SOC and the SOC comes to the assistance or whatever your direct line of communication is on things like that, if it's a slop sink door and something, because I heard you use the word break-ins, how are you recording that, right? You should be recording that in a way somewhere along the lines of that work order that says that it's vandalism, right, and that it was a break-in, not just another door that you went and repaired, because it broke somehow, right? Uh, because oftentimes what happens, depending on who you're dealing with, and when people come back to ask questions about, well, how do we know that is this or is that or the other thing, you, you can say, well, we've been keeping track of which ones are which. Because not every broken door will be vandalism or break-in, right? That's safe to say. Some of them are just old and falling apart, and one more good slam or bump with the hand truck, and it's, and it's coming unhinged, right? So you need to make sure that as the folks that are facing it directly bring it to the supervisors, the supervisors are capturing it the right way, right? And, you know, I know that there has been some difference of opinions about how you record information. So those are the types of things you should definitely bring to the union and let us know when people are challenging the way that you report the information. Because it does none of us any good, none of you folks any good, to not say that something that's unsafe is exactly that. Right? So that, I just kind of wanted to make that point. Right? And, and then I think that to Colin's point, to Irvin's point, working with uh, PSA and other folks in law enforcement to foster a much better relationship is something that we are undertaking currently. To will take us into our next segment which is communication um, and radios, because if we don't know about it, how can we help fix it? Reporting situations is vital, okay? Uh, and one of the things is radio communication. We should all, everyone who works out in the field, uh, in the specifically in the buildings, should have a working, functioning radio, okay? Uh, uh, a radio that you can communicate with either your co-workers or manage uh, the maintenance staff in the, ma in the maintenance office. Everyone should have a functioning radio, okay? If you're not assigned a radio, your supervisor must make adjustments to ensure that you do have communications. Uh, let's say there's a situation where you have two individuals and there's only one radio, partnering them up, okay? things of that nature, but you must have a radio. Also, we are aware that there are some dead spots. There are dead spots here, right? Uh, one of the things that we do is provide the push-to-talks. Those uh, provide a lot, a lot better service. And if you're talking on the regular channel, what channel do you normally use here? Seven. Seven. Okay. If you're trying to communicate and no, and, and no one is hearing you, you're not getting any feedback, go to the citywide channel. Communicate on the citywide channel especially if there's any type of situation that you must report. Don't go in without a radio to a dead zone without a colleague. Don't do it. Another thing, please, and, and I, try to do, I try to stress this, because when I'm out in the field, sometimes I do hear it. Uh, let's use radio etiquette, okay? Don't discuss what you're gonna have for lunch. Don't discuss what you're gonna be doing over the weekend. It should be for official use only. 
as maintenance here, we have a handheld radio, which is basically just phone calls. Now, in a situation where you want to get in touch with, say, a mass media of, of guys, they, there is an option on our phone for a push to talk as well but we don't have it, I think that's something the authority should look into getting us maintenance to have that available. Because if you're just calling one guy and he's not answering because he's right. in a bad spot, at least we could push the talk and get the whole the crew, the group, and let them know where we are. Thank you. That, and that would be something that we would definitely address. Also, let me just say, the housing assistance here, okay, I know that I go to a lot of developments and housing assistance that go out to the field, to the buildings, do not uh, take a radio. A lot of times they say, oh, we have a phone. Okay, as the gentleman stated, if you encounter an emergency, how many people can you call if you have your phone? One. Uh, hopefully they answer, okay? If you have a radio, and you should have a radio when you go on the field, you sh you'll be able to communicate and ask for help, or if there's a situation, if there's, if there's some kind of shooting, you're not walking out of the building and walking into it because you've been alerted to it because you have that radio. So it's important, housing assistance, uh, that when you do go out, that you do have that radio. Very important. It's, I'm going to start with the management office. The management office should be able to lock the doors so that anyone cannot just walk in to the, to the offices, okay? Uh, that, that somebody either has to buzz you in or have to, has to let you in, okay? That's important. Not, one of the things that one of the things that we that we looked at when we did the, the survey, uh, the developments is the ability for you uh, to lock yourself in in case there's any kind of uh, activity, emergency activity, a shooting, someone's out here doing some some kind of uh, things that you want to self secure into the locations. If if you cannot self-secure either in your basement, the compactor rooms, the motor room while you're working in there. That should be reported. That is a safe, that's a, a serious safety issue. We want to make sure that you, while you're working, that someone can't just walk in on you, or if there's some kind of emergency, that you can lock the door and close yourself up in there. Now, that said, we're talking about a slam lock, okay? Uh, we're not talking about the slide boats. Slide boats are no good because it'll, it, it'll basically take us a, a little longer to get to you if, there's, if there is some kind of emergency. Same thing with the, uh, with, the, with, the, with the HASP, okay, where they put the locks on it. If you do have one of those, like on the roll down gate, when you rolled, after you rolled it up to get inside, make sure you take that lock and put it on the, uh, uh, on the hole so that someone can't come in and lock you in there, okay? Those are some of the things that you think about. The person who described unauthorized person in a room that's supposed to be your safe room, you got to make sure, does this radio work what I, in the room that I perceive to be my safe room? And if it doesn't, tell your supervisor and let's fix it, right? It takes a lot of this takes you saying, all right, I heard what the McLean said, boom, but there's a concern of mine. Let's fix it. The door locks aren't consistent throughout the whole um, facility. We're aware of that. We're working towards that. In fairness, um, Knights is very focused on hardware, which is just all the doors hardware. For the stairwells, for your boiler rooms, for everything, they are trying, and different doors, trying to come up with some screens. We've actually had some meetings on that stuff too. Yeah, so I'm very familiar with the EML team. Used them a lot at the developments that I worked at and supervised. Um, I know that as I was leaving developments and going into central office, the push was on budgeting. So the EML group used to come out and they used to bring you everything that they had. There was no fee, no charge, no strings attached. Amen, right? I know. So now, <laughs> right. Now it's the development's responsibility to identify exactly what it is that you need and purchase it yourself. The, the, the beauty of having EML do it was they were expert. They could troubleshoot and they would, you know, they would just bring a bunch of things, but they would only use what they needed. So if you go out and your maintenance workers are not totally equipped or not all of your maintenance workers are familiar with those doors, the locks, the hardware, the magnets, the relays, you could be spending a whole lot of money on a whole lot of things that you don't necessarily need or won't work for you. And a lot of developments then resist even buying what they need.
to make the repairs. So what I would recommend is, you know, it, it, from the union <laughs> perspective, is that you get your maintenance workers to those trainings and pair it up from time to time with some folks that have the electrical background on those things. There are a couple of locations, right, that we visit that we have talked with folks that they got maintenance workers. I think one cat was bounced back from an electrician's helper, didn't pass the exam, became a maintenance worker, and taught the entire maintenance team everything that he knew about electromagnetic doors. All of that money is back in their budgets now. And, they, and the maintenance workers feel really good about being able to go and do those things. Why? Because when your maintenance workers want to move on, move up, put on the, you know, civil service exam and qualifications for assistant super, whether it's in a specialized department or whether it's in a location, all of those are skills that are on your resume that add value to people selecting you. So there, there, there's a lot of win-win-wins in a lot of different areas of this presentation, and this one in particular with the AML doors. It, it's in your best interest not to give a contract of $5,000 to come fix a few things that might have cost him 30 to get from somewhere, right, charge you 5,000 bucks, knowing that he's going to be back or she's going to be back tomorrow to charge you again. Again, it goes back to situational awareness. Um, the door locks are a major concern. Doors and locking mechanisms and doors, to me, are things that we should be able to fix and maintain on our own and will help improve our safety in a major way. I would say in to finish up on the door locks, don't make it easy on yourself and prop open the door. I believe you have um, common uh, st shared stairwells here in a couple of buildings, if I'm not mistaken. That's pretty tough when tenants are leaving where you're supposed to be coming in to work. I know the tenants prop it open, let's just keep trying to shut it. I, I don't know what else to say, but a propped open door, I'm aware of the heat, it's just not a good idea. And a lot of times, we're guilty of doing it ourselves. Dogs, I, I think it's a major problem. And Irvin and I have gone back on different topics. I'll give my two cents. I hope the air horns work. I don't even know if you carry them. The best thing to do is to avoid them. Walk around. Leave. If you're in a situation, make yourself smaller. Don't make yourself bigger. If you're going to do anything, do your forearm. <laughs> I don't, you know, take yourself out of the situation. Do not encounter that dog. Do, you, do everything that you can to avoid that interaction. When you have that interaction, and I'm no dog expert, I didn't like the one I had for 10 years. So when you, when you encounter this, you have to document it and notify your supervisors. You've, I've said it to you five times on different topics. The most important topic to document is, is uh, dogs because it's the hardest thing to evict somebody on. It's very hard. So you need to document that and where you feel unsafe. Get out of the way. Just walk around. Don't run. If you, if, if you, if you turn around to run, the dog has four legs, you have two, they're going to catch you. Try to walk, you know, step back slowly. Uh, you, 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 once you turn around to run, he's going to look at you as prey, and he's going to chase you. Just try to walk away. Try, you know, I know it's difficult, but try to walk away. See if there's some place that you can climb to get away from him. But if you run, he's going to catch you. I agree with the balance between what Irvin and Colin said. So I had my share experiences with dogs in the housing authority. I can't tell you how to get away because I've been bit both times, right? So, so I got no advice on how to not get bit by a dog. What I, what I would, it's the truth. I was uh, doing a fire inspection at Gowanus houses, tell the lady put the dog in the bathroom, right? And it's a mix. It's a Rottweiler mixed with a shepherd. The, the thing almost took down the door when we went to knock to begin with, but we got to do the inspection, right? And who wants to risk the zero on the fires? We go in, we do the apartment, we walk, <laughs> we walk out, everybody else leaves. I tell the lady, all right, we're going to leave. You can move it from that room to this room so we can come back. And she says, oh, okay and opens the door, right? And, and I'm anticipating the dog jumping in my face. It doesn't, it goes from my leg, bites me on the leg. Six years later, before that dog was removed. Six years. Dog had bit a child before that. It had attacked some, another resident at another location before that, and it was well documented, right? For you all that are here together every day to support each other better, not just physically or mentally, but administratively, right? So you can't out people. When people come and report to you that things are broken or bad or damaged or vandalized, you have to resist that temptation to say, yeah, it's just the same old hat. 
and they ain't going to do nothing about it, so I'm not going to report it. You got, you got to resist that. You got to keep poking your supervisor. Just do it appropriately, right? Keep poking the business agents. Keep poking us at the union and saying, listen, I'm documenting, I'm reporting. It's the same reason I gave that information <laughs> about those break-ins that the gentleman mentioned, right? You have to support each other administratively. My name is Jimmy West. I was a housing cop quite a while ago when there was a housing police department. I spent 20 years with the NYPD. I was a detective squad commander. Uh, the slop sinks... Each development's a little bit different with the size of the slop sink and what you can end up finding. I'm sure we've all found interesting things in the slop sinks. I found people in them. Uh, some places they stash guns in them, they stash narcotics in them. If you find something in the slop sink, just walk away because nothing but trouble. We all know that. Some of us try to do things differently. We try to take things out. We try just walk away from it. Report to your supervisor. Um, it, it can be a big problem, and we know about retaliation and everything else. We all got to work here. And if you're working here, everybody knows who's who, and you're just better off stepping away from it. Lock you know, the door and walk away. You know, a lot of the developments, they have keys. The, the, the people who use the slop sinks for their, for their, to, to stash things, they get a key from somebody, and they'll leave it in there. You know, the other thing is you find people sleeping in the slop sink. I found it. It always amazed me that you'd sleep in a slop sink, but that's where people will sleep anywhere. And you just got to walk away from that also, because if they're sleeping in the slop sink, chances are they're not really mentally stable. So you just want to walk away from it. Uh, we're talking about finding guns in there, and then we go right into the gunfire. I don't know how much gunfire you have here at Ravenswood. Some developments, they seem to go in and out. The, the brochure says very simply, run from the area. Stay low. You know, if you ever seen, watch the, the war movies, they say hit the deck. That's exactly what it is. The police department, we talk, talk about cover and concealment. Cover is something you could hide behind that's safe, a tree a mailbox, a door. Concealment is something you can hide behind, but it's not going to stop a bullet. This would be concealment, bad concealment, but it's better than nothing. Laying on the ground will help you. A lot of times people hear that and they want to go like this. They want to see where the gunfire is coming from. It's an instinct and then everybody wants to do this. They want to see if they can record it because it's, you know, you can world star it, you can do all sorts of things with that video, but you, for your own safety, it's the worst thing that you can encounter is a bullet. It's got no name on it. It's got no, no conscience. It'll go through a lot of different things. Your best thing is to hide and be safe until that gunfire passes. And a lot of times, you'll hear a little bit of gunfire. Don't just come running out then. Give it a minute, a couple of minutes, because sometimes people run away. They come back. They got their gun, and they're going to go back at it. You know, if you've been in that. Everybody knows it. But your instincts are to, to look and watch, and you got to override those instincts. Usually, I tell people to trust their instincts. But when it comes to that, that's not something you want to watch because bullets go all over the place. And too many people have been shot at in pure innocent bystanders over the years. Just take cover as quick as you can. Get away from there. Um, once, you're, once you feel safe, then you notify your coworkers. Uh, there's going to be a code word for shootings. Each development's going to have a different one. Uh, they'll come up with it, and you'll, you'll use that code word over the radio. This way wrong people don't hear what you're saying, and it's it, another little safety factor for you. Um, call 911 if you get a chance. To me, that's not your priority. There's plenty of people safe up in their apartments that are going to call 911. Your priority is your own safety, and you've got to be safe. If you get a chance to use your phone, obviously you call 911. But the main thing is to be safe. Um, and you stay safe until you get an all clear, until you know. Because there may be people in a better position to see what's going on, uh, and you, again, you listen to it. Stop and listen, and, he, and you'll hear it. Okay? I think the summary of everything is I, supervisory role is pretty, pretty tough because it always goes back to reporting and notifying your supervisor. Um, and in this situation, your safety is paramount. Then notify your coworkers. Again, 911 will be called by a million different people. Get to a safe environment. Know your surroundings. Know how to protect yourself. It's the key to safety. If you come, if you choose, I don't even know if Flex Ops is rolling out here. If you choose to take the morning shift and your shared stairwell has a wide open door, don't go in it alone. You do not have to go into a, an environment where you do not feel safe, okay? If I'm telling you not to do it and he's saying, if I know it's unsafe and they're telling me that I still have to take that job, how do I handle that situation? So what you do is, if they're giving you a, a job that you feel is unsafe, you, you can contact 
306-8800. There's, there's someone who will always be answering the phones 365 days a year, seven days a week, 24 hours a day. Okay, you contact them, you tell them you want to speak to a safety, a safety specialist, safety associate, and they will give you one of the, the managers or the, one of the safety associates, and they will talk to you about why do you feel that that situation is unsafe, and they will try to get some kind of resolution with the union involved. Okay, that, that's, that we're there seven days a week, 24 hours a day. Okay, if, if you feel that it's unsafe, you're going to have to articulate why you feel it's unsafe. Okay, uh, uh, and they're there for that reason. The situation is this. They will address it whether it's a female or male. Any employee who is either harassed, again, you, could, you have to document this stuff. Either, okay, either harassed or assaulted. They're not looking at if it's a male or female. It's a housing authority employee, and they will address it. They will, uh, 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 do, do, they will contact the resident uh, if you can identify them. L let me finish. They will identify the, uh, the resident. They will call the resident down. They will speak to that resident. Then the next step will send the folder downtown to, uh, uh, to, to, f to get a hearing, basically. Uh, it happens a lot because we're, we're there. We have a guard there, and there's residents that are having, he having hearings every day, every day. But it has to be documented. It has to be reported. I want to thank you the members who by default invited me in here through your union leadership. You're good, hard-working people. I mean, it's hard. It's hard what you do. It's admirable. It's something that I truly respect. Um, and, I, you know, I, I'm actually proud to say that I know some of you. I've got to shake some of your hands today. It is what it is. I, I, I respect you. Um, thank you for listening. I hope you took a few points out of it. I know the people at NYCHA in the Office of Safety and Security are, are trying to make it a safe environment. And I thank your union leadership, and I thank you. I hope you have a great weekend.